I want to um, introduce our second speaker, um, Kim Holt. Kim trained in paediatrics in London, Africa and Manchester. She has campaigned with many others for better whistleblowing protection and provided evidence to the Health Select Committee as well as to Sir Robert Francis and the Freedom to Speak Up review. I know that this will be a powerful session and I welcome you, Kim. It's lovely to be here and the introductory talks have really helped me because this is a very personal story. This is about who I am, finding out who I am. But also, I would not have made it without a network of support. This is about whistleblowing. And when we experience negativity as the result of whistleblowing, it's not something that we generally have been trained for, understand or know how to deal with. So by sharing my story, I hope to give people some insight, in, firstly, into why. Why did I carry on speaking up when there was a lot of pressure to stay silent? But secondly, how, how did I manage to do that? And how did I manage to be reinstated into my job and actually end up being able to retire at Christmas in a permanent post as a designated doctor for child protection? when 10 years ago, I thought my career was actually over. So this is a personal story. It began in 2004, when I joined the Haringey Community Paediatric Team, based at St Anne's Hospital in Tottenham. Employed by Great Ormond Street Hospital as part of an initiative to bring excellence to child protection in Haringey. We were recruited post-Victoria Columbia, because of the concerns around child protection practice, both across health and social care, within the London borough of Haringey. Victoria Columbia's death had been a scandal. It had led to the laming report and to the policy Every Child Matters, led by um, the Minister for the uh, Department of Children and Families. There was a lot of um, energy, there was a lot of enthusiasm I was an experienced community paediatrician working in the north of England and saw this as an opportunity to be a leader, to come down to London to help develop excellent services and to work as part of a team with a world-renowned children's hospital. This began in 2004. There were four consultants recruited, um, two who were more senior and two who were, who were sort of newly qualified with a lot of enthusiasm to work together to improve uh, child protection services. And from the beginning, we saw that there were a lot of system issues. So, so essentially, there are a lot of infrastructure problems within the department. So St Anne's is a, hosp is a child development team based within an adult mental health hospital site in South Tottenham in London. We're quite separate from Haringey Social Care. Um, we were quite distant from Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and our day-to-day -day operations were led by the um, operational directors from Haringey uh, Primary Care Trust at the time, which is, now, which is now defunct, but it was Haringey Primary Care Trust who were in partnership with Great Ormond Street Hospital. Essentially, one of the big issues for us was that the leadership from Great Ormond Street Hospital, our perception was that it was quite distant. We did have regular meetings with Great Ormond Street leaders. They came out to Haringey on a monthly basis, but day-to-day -day management of the service was through the operational directors of Haringey Primary Care Trust. So we began to raise our concerns we had been recruited to improve the service, so at, at the beginning it appeared that raising these concerns was, was actually what was expected, and we started a dialogue with the management. So from 2004 to 2006, we were regularly raising concerns, particularly around issues around liaison with Haringey Social Services. We had very little interaction with Haringey Social Services, we had issues in terms of notes, in that notes were regularly going missing. 
We had problems with capacity of clinics. There was no capacity in order to be able to follow up children where we were concerned about child protection in particular. So we were very, very stretched. And we were working very well as a team. The four of us were working well as a team. And in 2006, it has been investigated, we raised 60 clinical incidents. Those were things like children coming to clinic without their notes or appointments not being made for follow-up, where we felt that was a clinical risk. So we were following uh, clinical governance procedures. Um, and at one point, it has been recorded by a colleague um, that we were instructed not to keep raising these concerns because actually... Um, it was sort of getting a little bit uh, troublesome for the management team. Quite shocking. So really, the big, the big crisis came in 2006. In 2006, the NHS was under a lot of financial pressure, and there was a proposal to cut, slice £100,000 from our community children's services. The focus was on the child development team within um, St Anne's, and this was, the proposal was that we would lose one of the paediatric consultant posts, but we would also lose a little bit ac across the therapies, um, and there was a look at whether we could relocate our site in order to save some money on buildings. Shockingly, um, when my colleague, who was the named doctor for child protection, resigned in 2006 due to frustration, um, the proposal was that we would not replace the named doctor for child protection. And obviously at this point, having raised concerns for over two years, the emotions began to fly a little bit stronger. This was across the whole team. And in fact, in 2006, having just been to a management meeting where, where essentially we were, I was personally called inept for raising these concerns. We wrote a letter jointly, the four consultants wrote a letter detailing all of the issues that we had raised repeatedly over the previous two years with possible solutions. So we were trying to be constructive. However, we did say in our final paragraph that we felt that our concerns had not been listened to and that we were becoming increasingly worried about the situation. My other, another colleague resigned in 2006, and that left us with two consultants, myself and another one, um, trying to hold the fort. And clearly, at that point, things became unsustainable um, and clinically unsafe. This is where the story became more personal to me. I became more of a target individually. And in September 2006, I was referred to occupational health being unstable, difficult to work with, um, and uh, basically um, they were looking for an assessment from occupational health. This referral to occupational health had not been discussed with me. I'd just been on annual leave. It, a letter was on my desk. It had not been discussed with me, and obviously knowing the environment in which I was working in, which was a hostile, negative environment, a non-listening environment, I immediately became concerned. However, spoke to my husband, spoke to the BMA. They, re they, they recommended I go and see the occupational health and try and understand what was it about. When I went to occupational health, their comment was, we've seen letters like this before, um, and they were actually very supportive of me as an individual. They recognized the workload was too high, they recognised that the team dynamics were toxic and they recognised that the environment was hostile to me as an individual. And they made recommendations to Great Ormond Street to deal with the working environment within the department and to look at all of the paediatricians' workloads and work in collaboration with me as an individual. And they, they, rec they reassured me that they had no concerns about me as an individual in terms of my health, that looking at the workload couldn't address. I was, I was experiencing a lot of pressure from workload, but also the emotional impact of the work, 
and the emotional impact of working in a department which was increasingly unsafe and unsustainable. Um, so the last few months of 2006 became extremely difficult. And by February 2007, um, no action had been taken within the department. Um, communication had broken down with my colleague. And I, went, I was recommended to go on sick leave in February 2007 because of the... Essentially, I'd sort of fallen into um, a clinical state of depression. I was recognising in myself that... I was working probably 60 to 70% of what my full capacity would be, and that actually, I would, if, if something went wrong one day, uh, it could be a very difficult situation, and I recognised that in myself. My GP recommended a month off, and then we started to have meetings with Great Ormond Street about the underlying issues and how we could address them. This was in February 2007. Unfortunately, the response of Great Ormond Street was that, there was that, that the issues were all about me, that there were no problems in the department, um, and that everyone else was working fine, and the workload, it, that, wasn't, that wasn't an issue, and then we had to just get on with it. Occupational health refused to let me go back to the department until the issues were sorted out. So I was on sick leave for a few months. I needed, I needed sick leave to recover. And within a few months, I did recover, but then I was not allowed to go back to my job because occupational health didn't feel that it was a safe working environment for me to work in. So it was an extremely difficult time. And then in August 2007, a locum doctor, Dr. Sabah al Sayed, saw um, Peter Connolly with his mother and his mother's friend on the 1st of August, 2007. She'd been asked to fill in a clinic um, because there were no other doctors in the department. She had no information from social services. She saw Peter did have some bruises, but she did not have the history provided to her of all the social care involvement, the 60 contacts that had happened uh, in the previous months, the fact that Haringey Social Care were looking at whether to take legal proceedings. And, and she had no access to peer support, to clinical supervision. Dr. al -Zayat was a doctor who'd come from Saudi Arabia, had spent some time in Ireland, was not particularly ex did not have particular expertise in child protection and was working very much um, alone and in the dark. Um, and she'd come to Haringey thinking this would be a good experience to work for Great Ormond Street and to get some experience in child protection. And unfortunately, on that particular day, there was a misjudgment. Two days later, August the 3rd, 2007, Peter Connolly was found dead in bed, and the final terminal event was likely to have been the fracture of his spine, and he was covered in bruises and he had numerous fractures. So I was sitting at home at this time, watching all of this going on. And as soon as the news broke about this child that had died um, in Haringey, I knew that our team would be part of the story, that somewhere along the line, that um, St Anne's would be, would be a focus. But when I watched at home, because I still wasn't being allowed back into work, when I watched from home, what I saw was that all of the focus was on social care. I mean, there clearly were issues around social care and around the legal proceedings. There had been a number of events with Peter, and there was nothing coming out about health. I noticed I became aware that Dr. al -Zayat was still working in the department. Um, I had contact from paediatric trainees working in the department, begging me to come back to work, saying that it was extremely difficult working there. And I was, I was being told by Occupational Health and by Great Ormond Street I was not allowed to return. And then in November 2007, I was called to a meeting at Great Ormond Street where I thought it was a return-to-work meeting, so I was full of optimism that they recognised now the severity of the problems within Haringey. And I attended a meeting, and at this meeting, 
They apologized that things had been difficult, and they offered me a year's salary to leave my job. A shock. So this was essentially money linked to a non-disclosure agreement, which I think people are more aware of now. Very fortunately for me, I had my husband alongside me who asked for a break. We went out and had a conversation, and he said, Kim, they're trying to get rid of you. And I was like, well, I haven't done anything wrong, so how, you know, what, what, why are they trying to get rid of me? He said, they are trying to get rid of you. So basically, he set up negotiations with them. He said, thank you very much for the money. Uh, Kim really wants to get back to work. How can you help her find a job? So for the next four years, essentially, we negotiated with Great Ormond Street because I hadn't done anything wrong. They couldn't, they couldn't dismiss me um, to try and find alternative work. We, we were open to, for me to be working elsewhere. Um, eventually, I did work in Great Ormond Street for a couple of years, um, from 2009 onwards. But, but every time we went to the meeting, the offer of money was always there. It was increased to 120,000. And at one point, I did actually get to the point where we were actually meeting in a lawyer's office with the non-disclosure agreement, where they were trying to force me, basically, to say that I'd never raised concerns, um, which obviously I couldn't do. So, so uh, we managed to back that one off. So this went on and on and on. So essentially, non-disclosure agreement was a big thing, which I had no idea even existed. But because of my husband, who, works in, who worked in the commercial sector, he said, essentially, anyone can be paid off, and all they do is sign a non-disclosure agreement. We now know that that is a more common scenario um, because of the Philip Green story, um, but it happens all the time in the NHS. So all of the information that I had would have been hidden. So I'm going to go over time. So what I'm going to do is focus now on why did I carry on speaking up? Why did I go public? And how did I survive? So on the why, essentially it's who I am. But there are three choices. If you're in a situation where the service you're working in is unsafe, you first of all can resign, which two of my colleagues did, and go to a different job. Obviously, the service will still be unsafe because you've left it. And the second thing is you capitulate. You just basically do the best you can within that environment. But that's risky for you as an individual. And obviously, for the children, that is really you know, horrendous in terms of the risks. And the third thing is you can carry on challenging. You can carry on um, speaking up and raising concerns, which is what I did. So I went through the whole of the NHS establishment, the most helpful people were my MP and the journalists. Nobody, I think it's really important to um, make it very, very clear, not one part of the NHS assisted me in terms of speaking up and telling the truth about how dysfunctional our department was. Eventually, I did give evidence to the Health Select Committee, but that was many, many years later. There was not one NHS body, including the GMC, the Royal College, um, Department of Health, NHS London, any of them, CQC, that were interested in really what was it like working in that department. And the reason I did it was it was important for Peter to speak up and for other children failed by child protection. And it was extremely important for Dr. Alzaya, who ended up taking voluntary erasure and being suicidal. In fact, she'd never, I don't believe that she's worked again, so it was really important for her. And I believe, however good a doctor I was, it could have been me facing that situation. So the final thing is how. I have a very good husband who told me right from day one, you have not done anything wrong. He supported me the whole way through, and he saw what was happening, which really helped. Um, I had a lot of psychological support. I had weekly CBT at one point, Provided by Great Ormond Street, strangely enough. <laughs> but that is really important to keep your psychology um, uh, on the straight and narrow. Some therapy, family therapy, we've had everything. <laughs> and I guess how, you know, how was I've got really strong values. And I felt that this was needed to happen for all children who um, come under the watch of child protection. 
Um, because if we're really going to learn from these incidents, we need to be open and transparent. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I believe that non-disclosure agreements should be completely um, ended in the NHS because every time one is signed, something can be hidden. Um, but the other big thing which we need to stop is the hostile bullying behaviours that happen in some of these really toxic departments. Every time a bullying behaviour happens, it can impact on patient safety because it prevents people from speaking up. And I've had a lot of support from colleagues, but most of it has been behind the scenes. And since going back to work, even recently, I've had people coming up to me saying, oh, Kim, you know, I did want to say something, but... Or I did try and say something, but... Really try and listen to your colleagues, be compassionate to your colleagues. And if you see this type of thing going on, you know, as, as you suggested, be that spark, you know, support each other, because together, if I can do this by myself and survive, I think together we can really help to change the culture of the health service. I think the standing ovation speaks for itself, Kim. Thank you. There's been a lot of commentary from Twitter. Okay. His story, <laughs> um, even though some people were familiar with it, is shocking. Just hearing it in detail and sort of um, being overwhelmed by how impossible a situation it seems like it should be um, and the reality that you had to face, especially for such a long time. Uh, Katie Reeves wanted to know whether you had any specific advice about when work is so challenging that you have to take leave or quit, how do you move yourself forward and your cause that you believe in? I think, it, you know, as, as the previous speaker um, said, it's building a network of support, um, spending time with people who care about you and um, looking after yourself, essentially. Um, Therapy is, is, is very important because you do begin to wonder when everyone is focusing on you as an individual, is there something flawed in you? Um, are you really a nightmare to work with? <laughs> um, the other thing I did was, when I was on special leave, I actually went in and did a master's degree at the Tavistock. I asked permission from them. I said, would it be okay if I did a master's degree? And I found that incredibly helpful because the Tavistock, obviously, very uh, um, psycho, you know, therapeutically minded. Um, I did a master's in complex care and child protection. And that really informed me in terms of organizational dynamics. And I began to realize, also being away from work, I, I began to see it more as I just happened to be the unlucky person in that, in that particular place. It is around the organizational dynamics. Um, and it wasn't so much about me as an individual. And I think once you start to see that, then, then it really helps you to sort of get over it um, and depersonalize it in a way. Um, anybody who made the noise that I made would have suffered, there's no doubt, um, because that was, not what, that was not what was wanted by the um, hierarchy at the time or by the minister or by, you know, by the Department of Health or anyone, because they wanted it, the blame to be on social care or on individuals. And so anybody would have, would have suffered. Um, so once you've learnt, once you've been able to depersonalise that, it makes it a lot, lot easier. I found going back to work extremely healing. A number of people would have said, actually, do you want to go back there? But um, I think it... It proved a point. If I hadn't gone back there, people might have said, oh, maybe there is a problem with her, actually. But going back there, um, I think that's been very helpful. Mm. Um, uh, Joseph Matcher was asking, 
what's your view of the whistleblowing protection or lack thereof um, that UK trainees have or don't have um, referencing the Chris Day case? Yeah. Well, I, I supported Chris. Um, there isn't any whistleblowing protection. Essentially, it's around your employer. So whistleblowing law legislation is part of employment legislation. So your employer holds all the strings. So that's why he's had quite a debate about who his employer is. Um, because initially, the first part of his case, um, I believe Health Education England was saying they weren't his employer, and so they were trying to get out of the, the liability. Um, so that was the first part of his struggle. So it is all about your employer, and which is why I'm saying it is about the organisation and how they respond. Um, and that does come from the, the leadership team, that comes from the chief exec, that comes from the board, and the culture that's created within the organisation. Um, that is basically the key. So there isn't, if they are not minded to listen to their staff and support them, then basically you are, you are vulnerable. Um, and there is a lot of campaigning going on at the moment to try and change the legislation. Um, and we put forward proposals um, to the Department of Health to try and identify whistleblowers early on so that they can have a little bit more support, but that was, that was not welcomed. And you do begin to wonder, you do think, does the government really want to make uh, whistleblowing legislation stronger, or are they quite happy to let this carry on because things can get sort of, you know, in the, in the context of austerity, is there sort of an aspect of we don't really want to hear everything that isn't working so well? I don't know. I'm a bit cynical now, so. <laughs> Deservedly so. Um, we've got another um, comment and question from David Winton. He wanted to applaud your integrity um for standing up, for being so brave to speak out. Uh, I think we all are in agreement with that. He was wondering, what was the situation like in terms of the support from your colleagues and peers? So as I said, I had, I had amazing support from one of the consultants who resigned. He, he also went public alongside me, which I, I'm immensely grateful for. I had a huge amount of support from the paediatric trainees who gave evidence to an investigation by NHS London who were looking into this situation. The problem was, was that NHS London wanted it kept confidential, so they made me sign a confidentiality clause. So that was, that was extremely difficult. So I had quite a lot of support. People were prepared to give evidence to investigations. It's how the investigations are, are carried out and whether they, they have integrity. And that, we hear that time and time again. We know that a Royal College of Paediatrics went and did an assessment at St Anne's after Peter Connolly's death, and they found the service clinically unsafe. But that, that report was redacted by Great Ormond Street before it went to the serious case review. You know, so people were, highlight, you know, people were highlighting things. So it's something about you know, the accountability of senior executives in terms of we haven't, we haven't held any of those executives to account who redacted reports. They argue that they were advised to, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, come on. If the, service, if the Royal College of Paediatrics said the service was clinically unsafe, that is actually pretty important for a serious case review. So don't redact that sentence. It's unethical. I mean, there's no accountability at the moment for those, you know, so... Um, colleagues on the whole want to, you know, we're working in the services and we want the services to be safe. So we are prepared to, to feed information into investigations, but we mustn't be let down by the executives who then redact half of the report or refuse to publish it. That, that's, that's where we, I think we still are actually, when, when findings are embarrassing. It's incredibly embarrassing for Great Ormond Street to be running a clinically unsafe service and they didn't want it to be known, so. Mm. so colleagues were supportive, yeah. Uh, one last question. You said that anyone in your situation would have struggled and um, been targeted. How was the situation for your family? You, you mentioned that your husband was obviously very supportive. How did your family cope with this? And Yeah, so this is a bit where I'll get emotional. Um, yeah, my family, we had family therapy. Um, we went along. I talked to them at the point where I realized I was being bullied. We sat with them. I have four children. We sat with them and we said, you know, this is happening to mum. Do you think she should carry on? Because obviously I, I was pretty committed to carrying on. 
but obviously, if, you know, and they were like, no, bullying's bad, you must stop it. I, you know, but obviously you don't know, you don't know that it's going to go on for so long. I think they're proud of me, but I, I would say it has impacted on my family um, in that I wasn't emotionally available to all of them as much as I'd like to be. You know, that's, that's the mother's guilt thing. <laughs> We're all only human. Thank you so much, Kim. I'm just going to wrap up with a final comment from Richard Daniels, which is, a second successive story of moral injury. This is an increasingly common phrase in healthcare, undiagnosed and seen as weakness. It's real, it harms systems, and that harms patients, and it needs to be taken seriously. So thank you, Kim Holt. Thanks.